Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and March represents the fourth year since the beginning of the triple meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi. These were disasters that were man-made. Tokyo Electric would have you believe that they're the victim of an unimaginable tsunami that rose up from the ocean and destroyed the plant. But in fact, they are the perpetrators of this disaster. They knew in 1965 that a tsunami this size or even bigger could rise up, and they chose to keep the tsunami walls short to save money. The same sense of skewed priorities occurred while the disaster was occurring. Tokyo Electric underestimated the releases, they underestimated the exposure to people, they underestimated the time to recover and the cost to recover. Does that mean that Tokyo Electric is incompetent? I don't think so. I've seen the same behavior occur at Three Mile Island, at Chernobyl, and now at Fukushima. The response of a bureaucracy in a disaster like Fukushima is to save the bureaucracy and to save nuclear power. Nuclear power means a lot more to the bureaucrats than the health and safety of the people that they're supposed to be protecting. Why is this? I'm reminded of the Watergate movie and the famous quote, follow the money. It will happen again because this mentality infuses the nuclear industry. Costs and the success of nuclear power are more important than the health and safety of the public. With us today is Chiho Kaneko. Chiho is a member of the board at Fairwinds and recently returned from Japan. Hi, Chiho. Hi, Arnie. I wanted you to share with us your impressions, having just come back four years after this disaster. If you just go to Tokyo, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that in a, in a big disaster like Fukushima Daiichi happened. Everything looks pretty normal. But um, if you travel to Fukushima, and especially to the towns and villages near the nuclear uh, power plant, you know, the life there has completely changed. In, in many towns and in the villages, people still haven't, are not al allowed to return. So there are ghost towns. And on the coast, you, know, you see still up, upturned cars from the tsunami disaster, untouched, unclean, still left after four years. So these buildings that are destroyed from the tsunami can't be repaired because they're also radiologically contaminated. Correct. And also communities uh, with people, they are destroyed. You know, physically, people are not living there. A lot of people are not living there. And even though in towns where people are allowed to return, you know, people have trouble going back to their homes because maybe they no longer have work, jobs that they used to have, or maybe hospitals and schools that they used to go to or in the nearby towns, you know, and which might be uh, no, uh, not allowed to enter kind of area. So their infrastructure that supported their life, daily life, is no longer there. But yet there's a pressure from the Japanese government to bring these people out of the disaster relief zones and, and push them back into their own villages. Yes, I think that there are incentives for, uh, to pe for people to go back um, and I wonder, I, myself, I wonder why that is. And, you know, in some ways, I think uh, the municipalities, they're really worried about their towns and villages um, just disappearing completely, you know, just going out, which is a palpable uh, sort of a reality, you know. And then people's also um, love of the place which is, a different, which is different from their love of the town or village, but their love of the mountains and the rivers. You know, that's a very strong desire. So in some ways, I think um, by encouraging those people to go back, government can save money, of course, because, you know, um, instead of uh, paying uh, hundreds of thousands, thousands of people, um, to just live outside, you know, compensation. If people can actually return there in a contaminated area, government can save money. And in a small, you know, country like Japan, 
that's a temptation. How are the people in the, the state of Fukushima, Fukushima Prefecture, how do they feel having to leave the area where they were born and potentially now come back into an area that's highly contaminated from a radiological disaster? I think they're confused and they're worried, especially uh, people with small children in the family. They're very worried. You know, I've, I've heard many people, uh, older people say, you know, they may be able to eat contaminated food, but they will never want their grandchildren to eat. You know, those stories you hear over and over. But uh, it's very difficult to sort of um, see what is actually in your food. So people are kind of second guessing and the, they're the confusion. As, as I understand life in Fukushima Prefecture before the disaster, there were communities that were there for tens of generations, where ancestors are buried for tens of generations, where people worked for generation after generation in family farms. It would seem now that that's all been thrown up into the wind. Right. Um, people still um, grave sites and graveyards. Uh, it's, I spoke to um, a man from uh, the village of Kawauchi, which is a uh, 20 to 30 uh, kilometer zone, so 12 to uh, 18 miles mm -hmm. zone. Uh, he's, he, currently, he's living in a uh, uh, temporary uh, refugee unit in Kodiyama. He said his wife died in uh, 2011, sometime in the fall. Uh, she could not take all the relocation from one shelter to the next and finally to the temporary you know, unit. Uh, because she had some uh, physical condition. And so he said he buried her in the old um, village, even though he's not living there. And as I understand it, it's important to honor your ancestors, at least in the yearly holiday. But in addition, there's a, there's a deep connection to ancestors that is, is broken now because of the, uh, the disaster. I think that the people's love of the place was mountains and rivers and just natural uh, like four seasons, beauty. That is really strong, you know, even today. You know, people really long for their home. And yet, their sense of uh, like being part of a community, like a, a municipality, for instance, I think that's crumbling because the town or village or whatever, a municipality, it's not functioning, you know, physically and also emotionally. Sometimes in some areas, um, a municipal head, like a mayor or something, is at odds with its people because people felt like the mayor put the interest of keeping the village structure intact ahead of people's lives. So that kind of a community fracturing happening all the time, as well as within a family, you know, people are fractured, um, not intentionally, but out of necessity. Um, I spoke um, with a woman who owns a gas station uh, with her son in the village of Kawauchi. She returned there um, with her son s soon after the disaster only to just, she wanted to feed her daughter's cat. You know, so she just, uh, at that time, apparently she was able to return, even though evacuation order was in place. And she was also visiting the uh, uh, coastal uh, town of Tomioka, where her son used to live, because, you know, everybody just kind of left uh, in a rush, you know, as soon as they realized that the nuclear power plant was just blowing up. So she was going into the highly contaminated areas to pick up stuff for her son, son and, and, and his family. And it, which itself is kind of a mind boggling. Uh, it's almost like that, 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 that was allowed to happen is mind boggling. But my point is that the, uh, she and her son actually returned to the gas station in the village of Kawauchi. Why? Because the son felt like he really wanted to take care of the old folks who stay there. Apparently there are some people who just couldn't go or something. And 
you know, he wanted to make sure that the day they kept warm. So out of that commitment, and I think out of the love for the place, not the town per se, but for the place and the community, they returned. And sad thing is that the, uh, her son, you know, has a wife and a child, now a third grader. The, so her son's wife and, um, you know, daughter, they now live outside of Tokyo because they're concerned about the radiation um, effects on the little girl. And so, which is a really difficult thing. You know, they, the wife and the daughter visit him maybe a few times a year. Um, and every time they have to leave, they cry because they love the, you know, the girl loves the dad. And the woman whom I talked to said, that's the hardest thing to see, you know. What's, what's the most important thing? I think it's the family, she said. And she said unequivocally, the fact that Japanese government is trying to restart nuclear power plants is completely outrageous. It's out of question. She doesn't want anybody else suffer like this anymore. No, uh, no disaster like this should ever be allowed to happen. But as long as nuclear power plants operate, you cannot guarantee that disaster like this will never happen. You cannot guarantee. You know, and this is a society, and I said it when I was in Japan three years ago, that you know, the beginning of the atomic age with, unfortunately, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the opposite bookend could be Fukushima Daiichi. It could begin in Japan and it could end in Japan. And yet there's pressures on the people to uh, allow these plants to start up. It just seems so sad to me. This same woman who owns the gas station actually said something rather macabre. She said that she was shocked once um, when she was watching the television. Um, a boy, I think a junior high school student or something, from the town of Okuma, which is the uh, host community of the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. A boy from the town on camera said that, well, I think nuclear power plant and TEPCO, they have been a sort of lifeline of my family, indicating that maybe his family member might work there or something. Therefore, I think restarting nuclear power plants in Japan probably is necessary in order to bring back the sense of security and prosperity. You know, I, I found that a lot where if you believe that a nuclear disaster is not going to happen again, then you can buy into that mentality that let's start them back up again. But history's shown that we've had five meltdowns in 35 years. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and three at Fukushima in 35 years. So that means that once every seven years, there's going to be a meltdown somewhere. And yet people say, well, it won't happen in my plant, so it's okay to start my plant back up. I, uh, I just do not understand that, uh, that mentality. I'd like to talk a little bit about the collection of all of this radioactive material all throughout the, the, the state of, of the Fukushima prefecture. Can you tell us what you saw? Well, especially in the sort of uh, 11 or so uh, municipalities in, you know, in and around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, but even outside that too, you know, so you're talking about many, many um, cities, towns, and villages in Fukushima, you know, you have this huge uh, bales uh, that contain, like plastic bales, I think, contain radioactive soil and maybe some grass um, piled up, in some cases alongside, you know, uh, public uh, roadways in other areas, maybe just in uh, abandoned rice fields or something. So as you're driving down the road, there'll be thousands of piles of huge bags that contain radioactive material. And they're all being consolidated into even bigger piles, which ultimately are going to get consolidated into a couple of huge piles of, of bags, of millions of bags 
of contaminated soil. It, it's it's really amazing to see. You know, the good, it's almost like a in, incredible. I mean, I I couldn't believe my eyes. You know, sometimes the the piles are like five or six uh, bag high. You know. So I, at first when I saw it, is that some kind of construction, building construction or something? But no, it was they're just uh, piling those uh, bags on top of each other because there is really no, not enough place to put them. And I read somewhere that the, um, oh, this is some month ago, but you know, over 76,000 um, locations where those you know, big piles of uh, those uh, bales are um, housed today. And you know, the, the bags are designed to last for three years, but the radioactivity inside them will last for 300 years. So as the bags break down, that radiation then gets into the groundwater and recontaminates the communities that are supposed to be now cleaned. Well, um, the, apparently the uh, central government promised the um, you know, Fukushima municipalities that the, um, those um, bales are going to be removed to a little more permanent uh, location within three years. So they promised that over three years ago. So now uh, the uh, you know towns and village uh, heads are getting frustrated because you know now it's been three years or more and the bo those bags are still sitting there. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that the ultimately those contaminated soil and debris whatever will be transported to uh, just around Fukushima Daiichi site where uh, now they're going to uh, build a temporary uh, nuclear waste uh, you know, uh, facility. Now a lot of those drums are put into um, um, holes in the ground that are then lined. And we actually did a story about two years ago where a, a cut in the liner that's only an inch long will leak 60,000 gallons of water a year into the groundwater. So there's no way that a liner can be perfect. And so as these drums are, or, or bags are thrown into this pit, if the liner has one rip in it that's an inch long, 60,000 gallons of contaminated water really? will leave that and get into the groundwater. Well, I don't know how they're going to then safely transport all the bales, um, bales to the uh, you know, temporary repository because they're going to have to. You know, and I think they're going to start experimenting with the transporting of it pretty soon. No, the other piece of that is the uh, waste that's being burned in incinerators. Yeah. The, the, the bags of, of tree limbs and, and uh, grass and dirt are, are one issue, but now there's larger pieces that are being burned throughout Japan. We did a story about three years ago about the incineration of waste in Japan. And it's not safe for two reasons. First off, the, the, um, there are filters on the building, but the filters don't get all the radiation. The, the particle size, and I'm getting geeky here, but the particle size of the uh, individual cesium atoms is so small that it blows right through the filter. So they're essentially taking contamination from the soil, throwing it back up in the air again to have it land on areas where they've already cleaned out. Well, this um, incinerating radioactive waste is actually a huge problem, and it's not just uh, a, a problem for Fukushima. Uh, I'm from Iwate, which is, you know, uh, the um, 120, 150 miles north of Fukushima, but uh, we too have uh, radiation fallout from the meltdowns. And so there are a lot of um, radioactive um, grass, uh, hay, and logs to make shiitake mushrooms, as well as shiitake mushrooms themselves. You know, once they're uh, deemed above the limit uh, for the uh, government, um, you know, uh, set standard of radiation, you they they they're gonna be um, treated as a nuclear uh, radi nuclear waste. And what the um, Environment Ministry is trying to do is to reduce the volume by incinerating it. And, but then that is, like you said, you know, and th their point is that the 99.99% of the uh, cesium will be captured in those filters. But a lot of c citizens are now uh, standing up 
to protest uh, the, the burning because they don't believe that the, uh, everything is going to be captured. And they think that this is going to cause secondary uh, you know, radiation fallout unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah I would uh, support them absolutely. Yeah. The, um, the filter size is too big and the atoms are too small and they will go right through those filters and redeposit. So it's not just the mushrooms that are contaminated though. As you uh, work your way around Japan, I imagine there's contaminated rice, contaminated fish, contaminated beef. How do people feel about eating Japanese grown products? I think uh, um, to be really uh, blunt about it, people are less worried today compared to four years ago, except that there are some people who still really uh, scrutinize the origin of the sort of produce. And you know, some people say they'll never eat anything that comes from Fukushima or, or vicinity. But that's a tricky thing because um, you know, food monitoring is happening in Fukushima. And even in my home prefecture of Iwate, to some extent, which is, you know, as I said, 120, 150 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi, um, they're still testing you know, school lunches in my area too. And, but then if the food um, monitoring shows that the, uh, this food is under the sort of a government set you know, threshold of um, like 100 becquerel per kilogram, then it, it might contain some radi radioactive matter, but, but it can be salt. So if you think about it, you know, food you take directly in your body. So whatever sm small amount of, um, so like a cesium or, or strontium-90 or whatever, if it lodges in your body, then it doesn't matter how small the amount is, you know, it will keep emitting um, radiation and it can damage your DNA. So that is a concern, you know, internal radiation exposure, that is a concern. And especially um, mothers with small children, they're very concerned. You know, I <coughs> run into a lot of people who say they, uh, who don't really realize that the American standard for radiation in fish is 12 times higher than the Japanese standard. So what the Japanese won't eat, they could, if they wanted to, ship to America and they could sell it here for that it's unfit to be eaten in Japan. It's truly a double standard of horrendous I do not like to think that, but I guess technically that's permissible, right? Yeah. In America. Yeah, yeah. It's sad. The other issue is down blending of rice, for instance. If some rice is contaminated to, uh, that it can't be sold, if you take that rice and you spread it out into more rice, you're I mean, okay. you mix in with the uh, not so contaminated rice and it dilutes the sort of uh, radio uh, activity, then it, repackage it. You know, from a health physics standpoint, yeah. though, the same number of people are going to get cancer. The, the, you're more likely to get it from the one bag, but as you spread that radiation out among more bags, the, the number of people exposed increases but the amount they take in decreases. The net effect is the same. The same number of people are gonna get cancer from that rice. It's just that they'll be further away from Fukushima Prefecture and it'll be harder for the, st the statistics to catch it. That's true. Yeah, I have to go back to the remarks I made at the beginning of the hour. It's, it's really all about following the money. And th this is a uh, industry that protects itself and protects the bureaucrats, but really, really doesn't look out for the people. And I'd like to add that the, um, what I have witnessed in the past four years really reinforced the impression that once a nuclear disaster happens, nobody, nobody, not a government, not the, uh, the nuclear industry, nobody can r control the result. It's spread, it's time span, it's effect on communities. They cannot control. The genie's out of the bottle. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>